special guest this evening is Matt. Matt is a great resource, very knowledgeable when it comes to POTA. Obviously, if you're going to be an activator, you're going to, that says you got to take your radio to the park. That means you got to have radio that you can take to the park. And uh, functioning ham stations have three requirements for sure. And then I'm going to make the case for while a computer is, is technically optional, you're probably going to want one. So the power part of this is pretty easy. You'd be amazed how many parks have 120 volt AC mains available. Uh, lots and lots and lots of pavilions are wired for electric power. Now, you're going to have to check with the park whether you're allowed to just saunter up and plug into that or whether you're supposed to have a pavilion reservation and have paid your property permitting fee or whatever else. But particularly if it's a spot that you go to regularly and you get to know the lay of the land and you find out there's power available, you know, maybe you could just plug in. You can bring your own 120 volt AC. Uh, please don't, unless you really have no choice. Folks who are running way more than a ham station, if you're going to a campground where generators are the norm and you're trying to run a whole RV or something like that, that's one thing. But remember, again, we're ambassadors for our hobby. And uh, just like the, you know, the teenagers with the loud music, the folks who showed up for a picnic in the pavilion next to you, even if you've got a Honda, they don't want to listen to your generator. So on top of which they've got all sorts of little, little electrical problems. So they're, they're certainly not prohibited. And again, anything legal goes for POTA, but if I can dissuade you from making that your primary power source, I'll consider it time well spent. Batteries are where it's at, what all the cool kids are doing. And the lithium iron phosphate battery has, uh, has sent the lead acid battery pack only people who already happened to have one and it wasn't doing anything else and it's cheap and paying for a gym membership are still carrying around their lead acid battery. And it doesn't have thing one to do with the size and weight of the batteries. Uh, the lightweight is not the reason to get a lithium iron phosphate. The fact that a lithium iron phosphate is a 12.8 volt battery and it stays at 12.8 volt almost until it's dead. And it makes your radio a whole lot happier than starts at 12 and goes down from there is the reason for a lithium battery. Solar is one of those things. We got some people who I think the only reason they got into POTA was because what they really wanted to do was play with solar power. And then we got a lot of people who go, you know, there's a lot of pieces on that screen. Couldn't I just get a second battery, <laughs> like swap them out or something? But uh, you will find a higher percentage, I think, of POTA activators who've at least dabbled in solar than, you know, community at large. So you're going to need some power. You're probably going to get that power from batteries and that power is going to go into a radio. The beautiful thing here is that I'm not going to tell you, you really need to be looking in this direction or that direction for a radio. If it works, it'll probably work for power. I have yet to meet anybody who has attempted to run a vacuum tube set of finals off of battery power. It might work, but it's not going to work for long. Other than that, as long as your radio functions, it's going to be fine. There are some nice to haves. Frankly, they're the same things that are nice to have for any radio, for any use anywhere. A tuner is handier for a portable rig than you might think because antennas that are resonant when you build them and test them at home are not always exactly resonant when you get them to the park. You find out that the tree you throw your wire in is a different species and has more sap and the ground is different and you ran your coax a different way. And uh, I've had lots of antennas that were, you know, 1.1 here at the house that were you know, one eight to two, something like that when I got them to the park. Doesn't bother me that much because I run my 100 watt radio on 50 watts and my 10 watt radio on five. So. To, I'll run a 2.0 SWR all day long, but a little trimmer tuner is not, uh, not too bad of a thing to have. All else being equal, more power, more better, but it's effective radiated power that matters. So remember, you got to supply all these electrons yourself, typically in the form of a battery. If you can 
cause your power amp to make fewer of them and then radiate more of it, you're probably better off than trying to get a bigger amp. And, if, as, you know, the sun, welcome back, right? For the sun. <laughs> Those of us who got started in the depths of Solar Cycle 24 have never seen a three-digit solar index. These are great times, man. These are great. Here's the most important thing about the radio. You're going to be taking it portable, including outside. So take a radio that you're willing to take portable and outside. I have a, a quick story here. This same buddy of mine who's, uh, who's on the clock, <laughs> he called me up when he first got into POTA. He called me up and he says, hey, I think I might want to do this POTA stuff. Can I come with you on an activation? Of course. Come along. He gets there. He opens up the back door of his car and he gets out. As ICOM 7610. I swear the UPS guy, it was still in the DX engineering packing box. Like this thing was brand new. He spent the entire time he was there fussing about that radio. You know, what's that bird doing? Is that a leaf? You know, get your get your coffee away from me. He was not having a good time because he was just sweating this radio. He'd have been so much better off with, you know, a hundred dollar piece of junk where the volume knob didn't really work from the hand best he would had a, a much better time so just just bear that in mind everybody's sort of comfort level for that is different i said earlier if you ask five hams about antennas you'll get at least seven answers man <laughs> this is one of those things where i almost wish there wasn't so much theory on the license exams because it gets people into trouble they know that stuff is Oh, and therefore they deduce that this, that, or the other thing just couldn't possibly work. And it keeps them at home thinking that they don't have a functioning antenna when, you know, meanwhile, there's guys out there with 80 meter hand sticks mag mounted to the trunk of a Civic racking up the QSOs, <laughs> you know, is it an efficient antenna? No, but people have made QSOs on a dummy load. So don't let perfect keep you at home. Um, good will get the job done. The things we think about for POTA antennas are very, very different than the things we think about for home antennas. I talked a little bit about footprint earlier. I'll mention it again here. Things like throwing wires up in trees, you, you got to know what the rules are in the park that you're in. Here in Western PA, no problem. I had the ranger help me throw the, you know, back before I got a proper arborist rope. He was the one tossing the water bottle up over the tree branch. You step one foot into the national park system, do not put it anything in the trees. Do not stick stuff in the ground unless you're in an approved camping area. You got to watch what you're allowed to do. Time. Time is a big one. When you put up an antenna at home, typically, if it takes you the whole weekend to do it, that's no problem because you're, you know, fingers crossed, it'll be up there for 10 years. The, the park, if you've got two hours to operate and it takes you an hour to set up and an hour to tear down, guess how much operating you got to do? Uh, so you really need to to sort of consider how convoluted is this thing. What, know whether you're on a hill or in a valley. Yes, we have loads of great parks here in Pennsylvania. You know what they're all next to? Water. You know where the water is? At the bottom of the hill. There are very, very few lakes up on top of the mountain. So you got to know where your RF is going. The other stuff, like how much power can this thing handle? How many winters will it survive? Can my XYL stand the looks of it? None of that matters. You get to throw all those constraints out the window, which you always wanted to do. So there's a couple of categories of antennas that are real, real common in POTA for the folks who's, who have footprint as their number one concern. They're in a state where the state park system is not amenable to antennas, or they're mostly in national parks, or whatever the reason, they, they really, really, really need minimum footprint and these folks are almost all using some sort of an antenna having removed the people who are using their mobile setup right we just put them on the back burner they're they're doing their mobile thing the folks who are actually setting up a station in the park are using something that sits on a tripod of the three that are here uh, left to right it's a wolf river coil a buddy pole system and and a mag loop i think that's an alex loop might be a chameleon. The Wolf River coil, the coil loaded vertical is uh, by far the most popular. And even that though, uh, it's a vertical 
has radials. You got to watch, you know, how many kids are trying to play soccer anywhere near you. Two problem: these antennas, they go up fast. They have a small footprint. The problems with these antennas tend to be efficiency and cost. The buddy pole in particular. I know two people that have them. Uh, one loves it. One regrets it. Neither one of them can explain why it costs what uh, what it costs. But to each their own. Here's some out of my kit. I tend to be in the I. Hi, my name is Matt, and I'm an antenna aholic. Is is how this story goes. Once I discovered that you could make your own antennas out of cheap Amazon speaker wire, I I, I kind of lost myself for a while. I've made them all. The ones that I actually use for Poda, they, I've got a linked dipole. This is a lot of date. I've I've built a new one in the meantime, and then I I have a DX commander. I met Callum, the DX commander himself, uh, via the YouTube circles, and so he challenged me to get his DX Commander Expedition model onto my 300cc motorcycle for POTA purposes. So that's how I did that thing. The point being, these are resonant antennas. These are full-sized resonant antennas. And so for the link dipole, the, the little wire sitting off to the side there are the extensions to give me 80 meters. And guess what? You know how big an 80 meter dipole is? It's about 40 meters of wire. It's a big antenna. You got to be in the right spot at the right time to uh, to make use of that. But they're efficient, uh, no tuner required, and in many cases, pretty pretty quick to deploy. And if you roll your own, super cheap. The last category is the end feds. And I would say the end fed half wave cut for 40 meters is if there's a number one POTA antenna, that's probably it. Because it deploys equally readily via trees or via fiberglass mast. It's resonant on 40, 20, 15, and 10. And if you know how to wind some magnet wire around a toroid, can be built for less than 20 bucks. It's really a fantastic antenna. But like anything else though, it does. it's gonna require some sort of a support, be it a mast or a tree. Uh, if you go out to buy one, um, this is one of those things I kind of don't know how the people selling NFED half waves sleep at night, what they charge for, uh, for what they are. And the half wave is resonant 40, 20, 50, 10. It's very not resonant on any other band. So if you want to press it into service, you could probably tune 12 and 17 with the right tuner. You're not going anywhere near 30 meters. Not in any kind of efficiency. That's why the one in the middle is a quote unquote random wire with a nine. One on on instead of the uh, the forty nine to one terrible name for that antenna. That is the most carefully selected length of random wire ever. But it will it requires a tuner, but it will tune on uh, on all those sort of missing bands, as it were. And the last part is the uh, the computer's device, and I say it's one hundred percent optional. That makes the assumption that you're not running digital modes. I don't know if any of you have ever tried whistle the tones for PSK thirty one or decode FT eight in your head. It's tough. <laughs> it's, it really uh, it requires a compute device. So if you're gonna run digital modes, you're definitely gonna need one. To get on the spotting page, unless you're going through one of these, the CW Beacon uh, sort of backdoor shortcut, you're gonna need one to get a compute device of some kind to get on the spotting page. And then there's the logging aspect of things. And this is if there's a truly divisive issue in the POTA Facebook group, it's logging. It is a holy war at this point between paper logging and electronic logging, which strikes me as funny. I can't picture a bunch of carpenters sitting around arguing about hammers versus screwdrivers, but whatever. Tools are tools. I personally do both. I take a pad and pen when I take the QRP rig out on the, on the tiny, tiny little bag on the back of the motorcycle. I take the, uh, the Surface tablet every time I can because ultimately the logs are gonna to have to be electronic to be submitted to POTA. And so doing them electronically in the field just speeds everything up. And in my case, makes for much, much more accurate logs. I find when I log on paper, I forget to write down when I change bands or change modes or change frequencies, or I, you know, did, did I write on the, I, I'm writing down the minutes for all the QSOs and I get home and I forget what UTC hour it was. So the computer saves uh, to me from myself, but not required. If you do have one, it's going to require power. Not a lot, depending on, on your computer. Certainly not a lot compared to what a 100 watt radio draws on transmit. They've gotten much, much more reliable 
than they used to be. I almost never hear a story of my hardware died for these compute devices anymore. Ever since they went to all solid state drives and fanless things, they are, um, they're at least as reliable as the radios that were taken out there. But glare can definitely be an issue that, that surface that's there. Uh, I have that thing and the screen is absolutely, it's just unreadable in full sunlight, even with a matte screen protector on it. And RFI can be a huge issue. I cannot use my tablet with the random wire antenna. There's just too much RFI. The coax it's by design i'm using the coax as a counterpoise it's supposed to be there but every time i key up the my, the keyboard on my surface tablet decides it's it's going home without me so uh test this stuff at home especially if you're going to be hooking up a computer having it connected to your radio for cat troll and automatic logging is great but make sure you've got a handle on the rfi before you uh do that head out somewhere so just a couple of little tidbits. I, I can't stress enough that this is fun, that you definitely want to do this, that it will be a whole lot more fun if you do just a wee bit of practice at home before you head out. Set up your station, spot yourself. There's a park K-test. You can fake spot yourself. Talk to a couple of folks and then just make a checklist when you pack up so that you know for sure that you have everything that you wanna have. And then this last point here, your first activation, stay close to home, go on a nice day, <laughs> go someplace where you know where you are, limit your trials and tribulations to your radio gear so that you don't have any other sort of logistic problems in the mix. And uh, with that, I'll just uh, say thanks in, uh, in the two ways I know to say it. And we got a couple minutes for, for a few more questions. I have Perfect. one question. This W2ABE, you show where you were showing like dipole antennas. I thought you said you couldn't put anything in trees and parks. So where would you use them? It really depends on the park you're in. I can put things in the trees. And and in fact, the uh the particular dipole that I have, you can't really see probably, but this guy right, the ballon that's uh that's on a three printed part that has a a hole like a straw in the back of it so that it slips over the top of a 10 meter fiberglass telescoping mast which i hold up with a trailer hitch receiver in the back of my van so the dipole is actually one of my lowest footprint antennas because i don't put it in the trees i stretch out the ends i generally tie them to a, a weed a bush or a low tree branch or something, but I could just as easily tie them to little sandbags or water bottles or something like that if need be. Okay, the last thing is like you showed the three portable antennas. It seems like the body pole would be the safest to use because you don't need radials. Is that about the most efficient of the three? Uh, the most efficient of those three. What's the most efficient of, of these three is really gonna depend on the band that you're on, quite frankly. Well, we can say this, we, I can guarantee you the mag loop will be the least efficient of the three, no matter what you're doing. Mag loops are single digit efficiencies, which again, doesn't mean they won't work. If a mag loop is all you can must, the program administrator, Jason, W3AAX, lives in the DC area and has activated almost all of the parks that are part of the National Mall. The only way you can do that is man portable with a backpack. So he's got a mag loop that sticks up out of the backpack and he's done all kinds of things. So, you know, inefficient is not the, the end of the world. The Wolf River Coil versus the Buddy Ball, it's kind of a, a toss up. They're both going to be a whole lot better when 10 meters comes to life than they are today when we're mostly on 40. Thank you. Good. Is he still hey, uh, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to comment on that. The question that Fred had, for me, one of one of the joys of going out and working portable and doing parks on the air is experimenting. I get bored very quickly. I have multiple antennas from ham sticks to NFED half waves to nine nine to one random wire NFEDs. It's whatever you want to go out into the field with, experiment with. Decide for yourself what works, what doesn't work, and it's great practice, and it does touch on operating in an emergency situation because 
you're getting better at it. The first time I set up an antenna in a station out in a field, it took me an hour because I was fumbling with the antenna and untangling the coax. And the more you do this, the better you get at it. And it feels good when you get better at it because you feel like you're accomplishing something. I took one of our members into JLF to Harriman Mountain State Park, and we literally pulled over the side of the road and he looked at me and he said, we're going to activate right here. I said, yeah, we're going to, yeah, this looks like a pretty good spot. I pulled over the side of the road. I threw a ham stick on top of the car. I opened the hatch. I opened my go box. My radio was there, plugged it in. And I said, oh, wow, we have no signal. What do we do now? We can't spot ourselves, Jim. Jim said, well, I don't know. What do we do? I, I said, well, I guess we have to do this old school. We're going to have to tune around the band, find somebody. Hopefully they'll hear us. We wound up working some DX. And the next thing you know, someone from the Poda family found us. And as soon as he spotted us, that's it. It was, uh, it was all over. <laughs> it's the, calls, yeah. the calls were just pouring in. Yeah. And he was amazed. He was like, wow, that, that's how it's done. huh? Yeah, that's how it's done. Yeah. The last activation that, uh, that I did earlier this week, I ran exclusively the 20 meter ham stick on a mag mount on top of the van the least efficient 20 meter antenna that I own. But it was the only one that I was able to put up in the time that I had and under the conditions that I was operating in. It was, you know, for snow melt with rain, every place I went was just an absolute mud hole. And I made, I made a contact a minute, including, you know, some decent, some decent DX. So yeah, if I could have put up the dipole, would I have made more contacts in the same time? Sure but I couldn't put up the dipole and the ham stick sure worked better than having no antenna at all. Time for a couple of other questions. And I know that uh, Steve KA2YRA has one in the chat, Matt. Okay. And that's for a club planning a multi-band POTA activation. It sounds like the best way to spot, to assign each band a separate caller prefix. What's been your experience with that related to spotting, logging and processing? I've sort of changed my tune on this. The first time we did a club activation, we had the individual operators do the spotting using their own call sign. And then we were using the club call on the air. It just confused too many people. So at our combo Poto winter field day thing, we spotted WW3 triple A slash one, WW3 triple A slash two. And you can run that up to however many stations you have. Obviously you're not going to, use that on air or in the logs, but it's close enough to the call you're using on air that it, it doesn't confuse people. Perfect. Good question. KC2K. Stan, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, just one question uh, for Matt. Can you equate the uh, reference number of the park with the QTA anywhere? You can look, you have to look it up. You, you have to go to poda.app. You can type the park number in. There's a search box, top center of the page. If you type the park number in there, it'll take you right to the page for the park, which will have the map showing you where it is and the uh, lat long in text. There is no formulaic way to say, oh, uh, you know, 1387, that translates to this lat long. The, um, the park numbers were originally populated by copying the list from the worldwide flora and fauna program they were just assigned sequentially in there and we they've been assigned sequentially since then but you know now there's this discontinuity in which area got assigned when so the park numbers are just inside of random thank you any other questions who wants the last word i have a i have a suggestion for everyone Noel. Well. I suggest everyone that's interested in Parks on the Air, go to the website, go to parksontheair.com and go to poda.app and just look around, go into each section, read up on it because there's a lot of information, a lot of answers to a lot of questions. I know Matt has a help section with many videos and so forth that are very helpful, very well made. But go to those websites and dissect them, and you'll be amazed, especially the people that have done this for a while, 
that website is constantly being updated. I mean, they've done an amazing job. I know K2YRA, uh, Steve, he's on top of all that. And he's one of our very, very extremely active activators. It's just amazing. It's always evolving into bigger and better things. So I recommend everyone to go visit those sites. As well as, well as obviously to check out our website as well, too, in terms of looking at our special interest. So. Yeah. Yeah, but definitely, I, I appreciate that. And I'll put in a, a plug, especially for, there's the Frequently Asked Questions link on the, the drop-down menu on the poda.app page. And if nothing else, please, please, please read the FAQ. If it's been a while since you read it, go back and read it again, because it's constantly being updated. And I can tell you, as a member of the POTA Help Desk staff, people are not reading the FAQ. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, hey. Steve, one last comment. Why? You know, and, and Matt, again, awesome. And, and you know, I can't let the, the, this go on without a plug for our two area uh, coordinator, uh, James Gallo, KB2FMH. James is awesome because he processes all the logs. He'll do hours before he does his own, which is, you know, the ultimate sacrifice. And he not only, he's a great teacher, he's a great mentor, he's a multi person and you can learn a lot from somebody like James or whoever the appropriate coordinator is in terms of the right way to submit your logs. Just one other real quick thing you may have mentioned also two furs and three furs are kind of bonus but also working with like soda and islands on the air there's yeah. a lot of multiple yeah. stuff. Yeah I obviously am uh, am here to shill for POTA but all of the other something on the air lighthouses, islands, summits, whatever it is, as long as you're getting out and you're getting on the air, it's great, you know, go for it. It's just that I've done one or two soda activations and it's great, but it's, uh, I mean, compared to POTA, it's a whole lot more work. <laughs> so thanks. Okay, Steve, you have the last word. Matt, I just want to say thanks on behalf of Flark. Not only was this a great presentation, this was a clinic. Okay, in terms of understanding what code is all about. And hopefully we all came away okay, with some things that we really want to follow on. So obviously we've got our special interest group okay, that we should really be touching base with. Okay, we have 43 people, Matt, tonight on the program. So awesome. Uh, Thank you very paper. much for having me. You're interested in the topic and yourself as well. So you got a, you got a great group here. It's, a, it's an honor to be invited. I thank you for the chance. Great. We're glad to have you.